I'm not a puffy hater in that sense. I've seen it with my own eyes that he takes a record and makes it go to another level. In certain cases, he doesn't. You know what I mean? Because he may want to do too much and we should, nah, that's too much though. But you know, that's the beauty of our working together. He wasn't always right. We weren't always right. But the beauty of it is we had those options. Because if somebody did come in and made it incredible, everybody went with that. So before we get into some of those actual records, I was always curious, um, did you ever hear, know, understand, or appreciate what went on from Ready to Die to Life After Death? Because with the success of Ready to Die, why was it such a big change to bring in this whole other group of people to really take the helm of what Bad Boy was gonna be? Um, once again, the, the music was changing very fast, meaning radio was open for us in this time. It was like wide open. We were the people that had four slots waiting for us. Not necessarily bad boy, just hip hop in general, whether it was West Coast, East Coast, down South, there were slots open for us because the world was demanding it. You, you, you understand what I'm saying to you? So Biggie's album, right, Ready to Die, was a slow grinding album because 94 wasn't yet open for radio. It took Juicy a long time to explode. One more chance. Um, and our competition was making records that were ringing. Puffy, myself, a lot of us were club guys. So picking it up was a natural progression. The times were picking up, 94, 95, Wu-Tang, you know, records are picking up. And we wanted to be ahead of the curve. So for Biggie's album, it was, we were gonna slow down, we were gonna play a little more and give him a little bit more What's the word? Uh, universality. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and all Big had to do was dumb it down in certain times. So I'll give you an example. Big is probably one of the nicest MCs I ever heard in my life. But you hear a rhyme like, ladies, my Mercedes, hold four in the back, two if you're fat. That's, that's ABC. Come on. Ladies, my Mercedes, uh, hold four in the back, two if you're fat. The rhymes are incredible as you listen to them, but you can spit them word for word verbatim. So we, we as a producer, I'm coming and saying, we're gonna space things out. We're gonna make it more clear. We're almost gonna go back to the early days of rapping, but with the new flows and the new words and the new, <laughs> and the new pockets that these MCs found, let's enhance that. That was my job. To, so that was the, the change. Now, as far as commerciality goes, there was nothing street about Puff when it came to record making. So there was only one way to go for him. And when Mace came, it was simple too. You know, when I met him, when I heard him, I thought he was going to walk in with scars on his face and dirty and grimy. When he walked in, I was like, damn, I let him date my daughter. So there was no way we were going to let him go the locks route or black rob route. So everything was a and r for what it was. We didn't take nobody out there, box. We didn't turn Biggie into no dance heavy D. That wasn't who he was. You know what I'm saying? Right. We, we we just took who they were and said, now let's let's globalize this thing. That's all it is. So it's, that's the beauty of A and R's, which you don't have today. I'm a true A and R. Puff is a true A and R. And with the producers that we had around around us, it was easy to mold the sound for artists. It was very easy. What's interesting, you say that because the 24 Hours to Live, uh, which you also had mentioned, is one of those records that harken back, I think, a little bit for, for Mace, uh, just in the sense of sonically, it was a little harder. And of course, with the other people's verses in particular, yeah. it was a little, a little uh, more grimy, I guess you would want to yeah. say. Which, which we did purposely. Mace actually heard Money, Power, Respect first. Mace picked all the hard beats for itself. Mace, heard, Mace was one of the people that we wanted Mace to hear the beats first. He heard a lot of Biggie beats first. But from a sonic perspective and from an album making perspective, that wouldn't have worked for Mace. 
So he had to understand that even though he may have liked somebody got to die, it wasn't for him. You know what I'm saying? Even though he had money, power, and respect, it would have been cool for him, but we felt there was a bigger vision. But we got you. We're going to give you this one. We're going to give you, you know, this one. We're going to give you a couple of hard ones. He, Young Lord did the, um, the, uh, um, 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 the one with Busta Rhymes on it. Uh, uh, I forgot the name of it, but that, you know, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. But, yeah, yeah. So I was just thinking about something else though, as you were saying this, in the yeah. sense that on a producer executive side of things, how is that to talk to the artist and be like, hey man, I know you like that and whatever, but we're gonna give you what ended up being feel so good as opposed to, <laughs> you know, this this record you really like. And maybe you like feels so good, maybe you didn't. But my question is, how does that how does that work to where, yo, you can't have that. You got to do this. <laughs> it's it was hard. It was arguments. It was fights. It was not speaking to each other. You know, it was hard. But I like I said, if you in that room, that means you already mentally, emotionally, and physically signed up for the vision. So you're trusting the same guy that just made you a record in the studio the night before. We made a hot record. Then the next day I'm saying, this ain't for you. It's a hard pill to swallow for them, but they trusted us. So I forever am indebted to Big E and Puff and Mace and The Locks and Rob and Faith and Carl and, and those artists that I work with that quote unquote submitted as an artist to the producers and allowed the joint vision to come to life. That's true artistry, you know what I'm saying, to me. So I'm indebted to them. But yes, it was hard to tell certain artists that when they like something that they can't have it. And then they, to be right next door to the people that, are, that do have it and they're working on it. And then it becomes a smash. And then it becomes a smash. But knowing you got smashes too though, see that, that was the thing. It'd be a difference if we was giving all your records away and giving you bullshit. But you got to tell me what you want from me. Take a look at out of here. You got feel so good. You got a Pharrell record. Well, let me ask you what feels so good because, um, and this has happened, of course, many times throughout rap history. But right. that one, um, you know, Too Short had used that same sample from Cool in the Gang with Money in the Ghetto before. It was used like three times. Exactly. So that means nothing to Puff. Yeah, I was gonna say, explain. <laughs> how, what is the uh, because even though the perception is we don't want to use the same beat, people do it all the time. So how and the two short money in the ghetto was a single. They had a video and everything. Right. So how how did you guys? Why did that not matter to Puff? Why did that not matter to you? Why did it not matter to me? It did matter to me. I didn't want to do it. That's a famous story. I refused to do that beat. He would not let nobody else do it. He wow. wouldn't. I have no idea. You have to ask him that to this day. I don't know the answer to that question. I never cared because I didn't want to do the beat because it was too, that what, that's not what I wanted to, you know, that's not my digging. You know, even as, you know, it's funny because I always hear people say, you know, all we did was loop up, loop up, loop up. But to be quite honest with you, whatever the ideology was that people thought we, how we made beats, nobody was using the ones we used. It wasn't, they weren't common. As old as Roz was, I didn't use it till 96. So these guys had all this opportunity to use. It wasn't like there wasn't guys, it wasn't like I found this obscure record from nowhere. You get what I'm saying to you? Right. So it was bugging me out. But feel so good. We're actually hearing it with DJ Cool in clubs. Yeah. So I think that's why. I think personally that Puffy um, and a lot of producers, including myself, because I knew what it was going to do. I just didn't want to. I was like, I don't want to do that one. Let Stevie or one of them do it. In New York clubs and in some, you know, we were affecting clubs all around the country. That record never came on with rap on it. Two short versions, we, we didn't play that. So we knew 
we can compete with it. It was almost like the 70s mentality of three people doing ain't nothing like the real thing. There was three versions to that or ain't no mountain high enough. This group did it, then somebody else did it. And all of them had levels of success. And so the, that was our mentality. You know what I mean? To that point, uh, let me clear my throat to DJ Cool. When he used it, it was such an unorthodox record that as, right. big, as big as it was, I would argue, and even though I love the song, Feels So Good just would have more, quote unquote, potential because it's a more traditional sound structure. It was more traditional and it was a song. Yeah. His was talking. Structure. His was mostly, right. So, um, and, you know, to be honest with you, it was a great song. Like, you know, but Puff went, Puff just told me he needed me to do it. I, I don't know if it was simply because of the momentum. I, I don't know what it was, but he just, he wouldn't let nobody else do it. So finally, I just went to the studio and I just did it. And I got Mace in the studio and he had attitude. I had attitude. He didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. So he wrote the first set of verses and I let him go, even though I knew they weren't what they were. I knew they were what they were supposed to be. And I and we let him go. And Puff heard the shit and said, he just sucked his teeth at us. And he knew both of us. He was like, I, you know, please, I see something for this. Please go hard. So, you know, he never really did that to me before. You know, like, it was only two records in our whole career where he, you know, he said, I, I, I want you, please, can you? So he came in, he, he told us that wasn't it. I knew it wasn't it. I knew it wasn't it. The hook wasn't it. Nothing was it. I just figured I'd slide it to him, be a slick, because I can move on to the next record. He shut it down. So I told Mace, I said, you know, let's do it. You know, son really believes in you. You know, I, I'm sitting there, I'm the A&R, I'm the head, I'm, 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 you know, I'm the head in charge. So I'm, he believes in you. So he's not telling me to work because he likes to see me work. He's not telling you to work because he likes to see you. So let's do it. So I called Kelly Price, you know, sat in there with her. And we, the final version you heard is what we came up with after the speech. And what was the other record that he came to you for? Huh? You said what? there were two that he came to you and asked you to do that was unusual, not being one of them. Uh, oh yeah, um, it was a, uh, um, the other record was, um, uh, uh, shit, uh, fuck. Um, Jimmy Page, um, Godzilla, Re Godzilla Remix. Okay. Godzilla Remix, yeah, I, I didn't want to do that. Well, that ties nicely into one more question for you. <laughs> so that that's uh, Led Zeppelin Cashmere, which Schooly D also sampled. Right. And then on the B.I.G. interlude, you guys uh, remade PSK. Yes, that was big idea. I wanted you to break it down. How did that come about? How did Biggie, what did Biggie like about it? What happened? It was just, Biggie was in a fun mode. He loved hip hop, Biggie's uh, old school. He knew everything that was going on in hip hop. That was just one of his favorite records. And we felt, you know, we were doing skits and interludes and, you know, just, I didn't want to make a traditional 16 chorus, 16 chorus, end the record. 16 chorus, 16 chorus, end the record. 16 chorus, 27 of those. That's not how we make records. We wanted to flow like, oh shit, what's this, what's this, what's this? So that was just an ode to hip hop. It was his idea. And he actually, he was another one. I, you know, God bless you big, he was another one. I was like, I don't wanna do that, I don't wanna do that. Come on, Dot, me and you produce it. Come on, Dot. All right, I, he didn't, my, 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 big never called me Dot. Come on, Derek, come on, Derek, let's do it. All right, let's do it. You know what I mean? So that was his idea. That's why he's a producer on it. So I said, it's produced by him. Well, that, that was my last part. So what did he, quote unquote, do production-wise then? Or was more that was his idea? It was his idea. I did the rest. Okay. Yes, that's all. Well, there it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, uh, Derek D. Angeletti, thank you for coming through to Unique Access, man. We really appreciate it. We look forward to getting you back for part two because yeah, we barely right. scratched the surface. And yeah, so uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate you too, man. God bless. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official.
history of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.